Welcome to Alabama Chris Mill. Big episode for us. This is our 50th a podcast episode, so we appreciate all your listeners out there. Let me and I are very much thanking my co-host, Donna Causey. Hello. Welcome. I'm glad to be here for the 50th. We ought to have celebration of some type, you know? <laughs> yeah, yay. <laughs> you know, we're really enjoying doing this. I mean, oh, we are. We love the words from the encouragement we're getting from the fans that are listening to it, and we'll see how it goes. We'll keep doing it as long as we can. Oh, yeah. Boy, we've got a lot of stories to, to share with everybody that you might have not have heard about or you missed in a history class. It's kind of our theme that we've got running here. And especially with the bicentennial this year, a lot of events coming up with a historical importance yeah. in the state. And we're going to be covering those. That's right. We're also going to be interspersing a lot of uh, stories about the early pioneer days uh, back, you know, in those days and the challenges like we had last in our last episode. You can go back and listen to about Hawkins battling the bear. Got a similar story as well from the Pioneers Day of uh, Alabama's own Daniel Boone. Got a somewhat historical battle that he was in, the canoe battle. That one is in the textbooks of, of Alabama school textbooks. So everybody has heard about the canoe fight. Yeah, so he was involved with that, but he also did a few more things to make him the uh, Alabama's Daniel Boone. We, as you can tell, we've also experimenting around the podcast, you know, trying to see if, you know, you like them shorter, you know, or do you like them longer? So if you got any. Thoughts on that, send us an email. Uh, you know, let us know what you prefer or make a comment on the Facebook page uh, on the podcast. And send an email to info Alabama Pioneers.com. Yeah, it's, that way we can kind of know what you like. Uh, we're trying to keep them, you know, something like that, like similar to the stories. We're trying to keep them short, you know, but in depth enough where they're interesting. So that's kind of the goal here, but don't want to get too lengthy. We have a lot of these stories in at the, on the website, too. So if you want to know more facts and some more of the people involved, then just go to the website. You'll see pictures yeah. there, too, So and films. As we always mentioned, you know, because this is basically how we support the uh, podcast and doing all this, is uh, you can uh, support us by becoming a patron to the site. And it's a little as a $1 or even a $2 a month, a cup of coffee a month. That would be... It helps us keep it going, pay all the uh, the computer fees and things like that. So those are appreciated. And uh, you can do that on the AlabamaPioneers.com website. Just click the Be a Patron button. But uh, we'll just go ahead and get on into the story now. And here, tell us, uh, tell us a little bit about uh, Alabama's Daniel Boone. Yeah, this, he ranks up there with Daniel Boone, Davy Crockett, Buffalo Bill, all of them. His name is Samuel Dale, and you've probably heard of him before because uh Dell County, Alabama, was named after him. He was in, like I said before, he was in the canoe fight with the three men fought the Native American in canoes. So if you, that story is well written and all, but we, we don't know a whole lot necessarily because a lot more has not, of his life has not been included in uh, textbook articles. He was popular with the Creek uh, Native Americans, the Choctaws, and the Cherokee. They called him Big Sam. So he got along with both white people and the Native Americans. He was well thought of. That that would be hard to do during those times. He served in the legislature of Alabama for Monroe County, and he was a brigadier general in the Alabama militia. He was well known even in Mississippi because he was, came over during the part of the Mississippi when was in the Mississippi Territory, and he was the first representative from Lauderdale County, Mississippi. His history goes back to Scotch-Irish extraction. His parents were Native Americans of Pennsylvania, and they moved to Virginia, where Sam was born. But his father purchased land on the edge of the frontier. They must have been... He he. There's a story about him, too, that's very interesting, many of them, because he, he was a typical frontiersman. It went and subject to attacks from the local Native Americans who did not really want them moving into the area. So uh, he faced many challenges when he was growing up and helped his father out in those challenges. In November 1791, his father decided to move on into the more frontier land, and he went to Green County, Georgia, and bought a tract of land near Carmichael Station that he paid 7,000 pounds of tobacco for. And there he built a cabin. But he didn't run into very good luck because he lost all his horses that he brought, but one to blind staggers, which was a prevalent disease for stock and wildlife then. His wife died, which was Sam's mother, the following Christmas. 
And one week later, he died. His, the father died. So here was Sam. He was le- not even 20 years old yet. And he was left the head of a family of eight younger children than him. And one was still an infant, if you can believe it or not. He, and he was not even, like I said, not even 20 years old yet. Some people say it was around 16, I think is the age he was. Speaking of this, Sam Dale recorded in his own memoirs. And I, I think it'll kind of tell you how he felt by just quoting him. And so I want to quote him here. Never have I felt so crushed and overpowered by the feeling of helplessness and isolation. No foot of earth could be called our own. We were crushed with debt. No kindred blood or opulent friends to offer us sympathy or aid. Eight brothers and sisters, all younger than myself, with one an infant, looking to me for bread. And the wilderness around our lonely home, swarming with enemies. Yeah, it's just hard to imagine that. And it goes on. In this state of mind, on the night after we laid father by our poor mother's side, when my little brothers and sisters had sobbed themselves to sleep, I went out to their graves and prayed. Ah, those who are cradled in luxury and surrounded with opulent kindred cannot know the whole strength of the tie that binds together parent and child that have no friends and how it tears the heart when that tie is broken. And we can feel his pain during those words. He goes on to say, "'Tis the survivor that dies. I went to the grave, a broken-hearted, almost despairing boy. I came back, a tearful and sad, but hopeful and resolute man. I felt the weight of responsibility upon me that I must be both father and mother of those orphaned little ones. I had faith in Providence and in myself, and when they woke, I met them with a smile and with kind words and cheerful spirit.' We all went resolutely to work according to the strength, and God blessed our labors. I I just wanted to quote those because, I mean, that really puts into perspective what he was faced with and how he went to God for help. The memory of that night and the strength he got from from praying at the graves of his parents lived with Sam Dale in many times of trial and danger throughout his life because he spoke of it often. In 1793, which is a few years later, the Native Americans were becoming discontented with the incursions of the whites, and so Sam volunteered for service for protection of the frontier. And with the pay for his few months' service and a first-rate crop on the farm, Dale managed to pay off more than half his debt on the farm in the following year. The farm debt was paid completely off. So he was very astute in managing his money at even that age. And you got to remember, he, he was on less than 20 years old at the time. I can't imagine all he had to do. His confrontation between the Creeks and the Chattahoochee River continued, and Dale soon gained recognition as an Indian scout fighter and guide in the Creek War. In 1796, Sam's military company was disbanded. He did not have that income anymore, so he had to come up with something to provide for the family. He procured a four-horse wagon to start a wagoning business, and that grew successful. In 1799, he started trading with the Indians and worked with them, even though they had been enemies. And he assisted immigrants who were moving to the Mississippi Territory through Creek Country. He and Alexanders were appointed as guides to commissioners to mark a highway through Cherokee Territory in 1803. They knew he would be beneficial because he had his connections with all the Choctaw Creek and Cherokee. Dale settled in Clark County, Alabama in 1810, so it's a very early age, well before we became a state, and was present at many important historical events in Alabama history. One of them was when Tecumseh, arrived in Alabama and made his famous appeal to the Creeks for assistance in driving the right ways out of the country. After the massacre at Fort Mims, he took charge of Fort Glass. Colonel Carson was ordered to abandon Fort Madison, which is only 15 miles away from Fort Glass, which Dale was in charge of. Colonel Carson reluctantly left, while at the same time, Dale remained, and he sought volunteers to stand with him at Fort Glass. Well, he wound, he must have been well thought of because 50 men volunteered to stay, and as Carson's men marched out, Dale's marched in. Many exploits during the Creek War could be attributed to the bravery of Dale, and he became famous and 
and was also one of the men, three men in the battle in the canoes on November 12, 1813, which is mentioned in textbooks, where a hand-to-hand fight took place between three white men, Samuel Dale, Jeremiah Austell, and James Smith, and nine Indians. And there, Caesar, an African-American slave, held the canoes together while the fight took place. One of the Native Americans was thrown in the water, and the other eight were killed. They were battled with clubbed guns, and only it only lasted a few minutes, but it gave all three men a big reputation for their courage, just standing up to that. After the war was over and peace was restored, Dale moved to Monroe County and later Chief Weatherford of the Creeks, moved into white settlements near Montgomery and married there. And believe it or not, they had fought as bitter enemies. Samuel Dale was the best man at Weatherford's wedding. Dale was also sent with an important dispatch to General Jackson at New Orleans. He had to travel through Indian country alone to reach the general, but he knew the Indian country better than most of the men, so he was successful. After the war, he settled into other peaceful pursuits, and he was not educated, but he had learned, like a lot of the frontier men did, as he learned to read and write by studying books and things that were around. He took advantage of every opportunity to learn. And he learned enough to serve in the legislature of Alabama and Mississippi. He died May 24, 1841, and he is buried in Lauderdale County, Mississippi. And Dale County, like I said before, is named in his honor. Well, what really got me with that story was the uh, the prayer. I mean, that was pretty uh, 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 descriptive, I... descriptive moment or, you know, a tough time. And just really laying it out there how difficult things were at that age or that time and the, that age that he was at. Yeah, and to to overcome all he did, it, that that is even further. I mean, he, he and he attributed God to taking care of him through that difficult time. And all the children and raising them. <laughs> I can't imagine a 16 year old doing that today. I just it's just no. hard. To, but I guess <laughs> no. I could. If you, it, it would be very interesting. But just being there all by yourself, you know, your parents kids, just take you into the wilderness. Play video games. They can play video games today. But as far as, you know, raising a family and. In the wilderness, eh, not so much. Uh, yeah, it's sad, you know, that uh, we've lost so many of those primitive skills that he managed to acquire, I guess, from his from those times. They survived in spite of everything. And he was well thought of by both the Native Americans and the uh, white. That was another unique thing. And I think that goes to his, his feelings and connections with God. And that, and you know, his character was really respected at those times. Where you're yeah. true to your word, true to your, and then you're also, you know, he's a, a brave and strong fellow, you know, with the battles he's been in and the fights and the canoe fight and uh, all that stuff. So, I mean, it kind of got that respect. Mm-hmm. That's what you call real character. Well, you can find this story in uh, the canoe fight. All those stories are on the uh, website and you can say, get more details on that. I can't think of a better uh, story to have on the, the 50th episode that we've got. There's some more information um, about Jeremiah Austell, who was another member. He he gives a, a there's an account. He he wrote a memoir that accounts the, uh, actually describes the canoe fight. I imagine we'll have that. I believe that's coming up in an episode in the future. Yeah, maybe, got yeah on. probably down the line. We'll get to it. It's fun to read those actual uh, word of mouth accounts, you know. Yes. From the participants that took place in it, you know, instead of just uh, something that you're reading a little little comment in a textbook. I think a lot of people in school read about the canoe fight, but you didn't really realize the involvement of what took place and, you know, the people involved. Or the reality of it, yeah. Well, you didn't, yeah, you didn't see the reality of it all. I mean, you've learned the general facts of, oh, there's a canoe fight, people fall in it, you know, they're in the water, but... When they describe it the way they did, especially like they did, he did in that prayer, it just gives you a, a visceral feeling of how it really it really was. So that's why I try to put so much tra- actual transcriptions on the website so you can see that in some of the books too. You'll find the words of the, that were written in the treaties made by the Native Americans, what they were saying, how they felt. They put their heart into their speeches. And that really makes a difference. It helps you understand history a little bit different. It's not just something that's back there. These were real people with real experiences, and you feel that pain that they're going through in their words. And writing and putting things down in a 
into words or speeches were probably a lot more valuable back then because they were as they were, I guess, rare. Oh I mean, yeah. People were, I mean, you know, you're not sending text messages off somebody in the middle of the day. You're no, you're, you're sitting. Th- <laughs> you're sitting down and you're thinking about what you're writing. Right. That what what would happen? Uh, usually, somebody recorded the event because if it was important, and they would be a secretary writing it down, describing exactly what happened. And then other people would. A lot of things got written up in newspapers too. That of people that observed things that were going on. So that really, that when you find something like that, it's so valuable. Yeah, I'm just kind of getting, saying it's some of it's getting lost today with everybody going back to just short communication and brief communication, and we're losing a little bit of that description. And uh, yes, we can record it with video and all that, so you do gain that aspect of it, but you don't get your people's thoughts as much into it as well as you probably did even the, even back in the pioneer days. Exactly. You know, and the observations that everybody around, everybody has a different perspective of an event. And, you know, there's there's both sides with that fight in the canoe. I mean, there's the Native American. We don't have a whole lot from the Native American perspective. That's what's so sad, you know, because you've got to understand the total thing. You can't take things out of context too much. You've got to nope. understand the whole thing, the whole situation. And you can only get that from the people that did manage to record things. It's important to record it today. You know, things that you feel today. And and more so than a just, you know, just videoing something or just getting your phone and taking a picture of it, actually, you know, putting your thoughts down because that's what people are interested in. It's not, you know, necessarily the event as it, everybody else has captured it. It's just put what people have thought about it in their perspective. That's exactly right. It's, We've lost right, so much I'm of going, that. I may be getting too deep there. Yeah, I am <laughs> going too. Off on well, we better let <laughs> go. We can go in that direction. <laughs> Probably wrap this up. Yep. Well, we'll go ahead and uh, wrap this one up. Uh, got many more episodes coming up in the future. I appreciate everybody and uh, uh, and the interest in the podcast. Please share it with uh, friends and family that are be interested in it. Love to get the more word out there and get it out uh, to as many people as possible. So. Uh, but that being said, we'll go ahead and let Red Foley play us out with a little Alabama Jubilee, and we'll see you next time. I'll talk to you later. Right on his toes, throws away his crutch and hollers. He let her go, oh honey, 